guys. Thank you so much for joining us for week three of our collection, Gray. The craziest thing about these bumper videos is I never know like the right time to get up on stage. So it's all, all, a little awkward, but it's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm probably the most awkward person on staff, so what are you going to do? <laughs> uh, last week, uh, Pastor Hannah, she talked about, um, you know, God just wanting us to be happy, right? The, the weird half-truth that, that we've convinced ourselves is the absolute truth that God just wants us to be happy. And today, we're going to be taking at a look uh, in Acts uh, chapter 16, verse 29 through 30 to kind of get into what we're going to be speaking about today, this true-ish uh, belief, maybe, that, that we so commonly believe, and, and we're going to try to get to what the capital T truth is. And so some context for Acts uh, this pa- particular passage is when Paul and Silas are in prison. So they've been thrown in prison in Rome, and at midnight, they've been in prison for, for a while. At midnight, they decide, you know what? We're just going to start praising God. We're going to start worshiping God and, and, and just see what happens. You know, we're, we may be executed. We don't know what's going to happen, so we're just going to praise. And so they start worshiping God, and uh, something kind of crazy happens uh, while they're doing that, an earthquake. God sends an earthquake. Uh, Acts says that God sends an earthquake, and it shakes off the chains from the prisoners, and it breaks open the prison doors, and what do you think is going to happen? The prisoners should escape, right? Well, so the jailer, he's losing his mind. Like, he's freaking out. He knows if these prisoners escape on his watch, it's over for him. He's, he's going to get executed for that. And so he's, he's in a state of panic, and he draws his sword to, to kill himself. He's like, I'd rather go out my way than go out, you know, being fed to lions, getting sent to the Colosseum. Like, something majorly bad could happen to this guy. And he's like, I'm going to do it on my own terms. And Paul sees him doing this, and he yells at him. He's like, hey, stop. Whoa, what are you doing? You, go, you need to stop doing this. And so the main point of today's message comes in right after this. And so Paul has yelled at the guy, and it says this, And the jailer called for lights, and he rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so this is the crux of today's message. What must I do to be saved, or really what we're tackling today is, is it that question asked another way. Does it matter what I believe as long as I'm sincere? And so this, this jailer, he was speaking of salvation as in, like, what must I do so I don't get killed uh, by the Romans when they find out that all of you guys have got out on my watch? But Paul is looking at something deeper, and he, of course, turns this around and and tells him that he needs to believe in Jesus Christ, and yada, yada, yada. You can read it, Acts 16. It's all in the Bible. It's been there for a couple thousand years. It's just a little book. I don't know. (laughs) But this is something that we've all heard. I can't tell you. My last job that I just left, which is kind of bittersweet, but we used to get in debates all the time, philosophical debates constantly, and one of my coworkers, his main thing was always, you know, I just think that if I'm, you know, a good person, that if there is a God, then he should surely just honor that, right? He should, he should acknowledge that I've been a good enough person. I should be able to go to heaven. And my question was him, good according to who? Like, who have you been good according to? Good to yourself? Like, who gets to decide how good you've been? You don't get to make up the rules. If there is a God, it's obviously his rules, not yours. So if you're saying you've been good enough, good enough to who? And and this belief is rampant in our society. You hear it all the time. It doesn't matter, you know, what you believe. You know, as long as you're sincere enough, God should should notice you. As long as you're a good enough person, God should count that for something, right? You know, I helped an old lady across the street the other day. Like, you're welcome, God. Like, (laughs) let me in, please. I deserve this. I earned it. You know, I, I did my good deed for the day, and I should get in to heaven. And, and this idea is everywhere. It's this idea of relativism that, that you know, everything is just relative. It, it's whatever I do, as long as I'm good in my own eyes, 
should it matter what everybody else thinks or what everybody else does as long as you're, you're doing your thing. You do you, and that will be good enough. Um, but the problem is that there is a certain thing called the truth, and, and we don't <laughs> like that. We don't. You know, we always say, oh, you know, just, just live your truth. That's just my truth, you know, my truth. Well, you don't, there is no your truth. There's your opinion. There's your experience. There's your perception. But that's not the truth. Like, that's just your, that's just something you, you've been through. That's not a truth. Like, you maybe, you know, you grew up poor. Well, it might be true that your parents were poor, but the way that that shapes you is kind of on you at, after that. Like, you get a hand dealt to you, and you decide how to play. It's like poker. I'm terrible at poker, but, you know, people like to play it for fun, and I'm the worst at it because even if I have good cards, I don't know what the heck to do with them. <laughs> so it's like, it's just lost on me. So it might, the truth is the truth. And, and you know, I, when I'm thinking about this, I always think about when I was a kid, you know, or when we were all kids, there were tons of things that I was sincere about, you know. Uh, I was sincere when I was a kid and thought I was going to play for the MLB. Uh, and sadly, <laughs> that didn't, didn't work out. You know, I was sincere when I woke up on Christmas morning expecting that Santa Claus had come, and then I got to adulthood. Uh, I was sincere when I found out, you know, that the tooth fairy paid out big bucks at my grandparents' house. But at my own house, did not pay out the big bucks. I mean, the tooth fairy, you lose a tooth, you could get $100. At my house, you could get a nickel. So you don't, you know, it's like, oh, I lost a tooth going to grandparents' house. <laughs> I was sincere when I thought if I just prayed hard enough, God would let me be able to fly like Peter Pan. I was obsessed with Peter Pan, and thank God I never, like, tested that theory out as a kid. Uh, but I just thought if I prayed hard enough, God was going to just let me fly. And, you know, these are all cute examples, and I'm sure we all had similar kind of beliefs when we were children, things that we thought were true about us that weren't true, you know. No matter how sincere I was about playing in the MLB, the truth is, I just was not good enough. Like, the only thing I can do is just wear an Astros hat. It doesn't mean I play for the team, you know. Uh, maybe they could have used me last night, though. Who knows? <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, no matter how sincere I was around Christmas time, there was no one, Santa wasn't checking the list because he's not there, <laughs> whispering for the kids out there. <laughs> no matter, you know, how hard I prayed, it's quite obvious that I had to drive here this morning. The laws of physics did not break down and bend for me to defy nature and fly here. I wish they would be kind of cool, but they didn't. Because that's not the truth. There's a, different, there's a difference between what I'm sincere about, when what I even sincerely believe, and what the truth is. And believing that you can believe a truth, or you can believe a lie. And the truth, it's uncomfortable, especially when it comes to faith. Especially when it comes to faith. I mean, you turn on the TV, you see people all the time, oh, I'm a spiritual person. Like, what does that even mean? You're a spiritual person? I'm, okay. You know, I believe in a higher power. There's a, I believe there's a higher power. I, I believe that the universe is going to dole me out some good stuff because I did a couple of things that I thought were good. Uh, you know, or at award shows all the time, you see, oh, I just want to thank God for this award and, and where I am. And if you notice, when people say these things, no one gets uncomfortable about them because they're so nebulous and they're so just wishy-washy. It could be talking about anything, and no one bats an eye when they talk about that. But if you talk about Jesus, when you mention the name Jesus, if you say you believe in Jesus, people start getting really uncomfortable. And if you don't believe that, consider a point in your life whenever you've had the opportunity to talk about Jesus. I guarantee you, you felt uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable sometimes. It just is what it is because he's controversial. Right? He said some things and did some things that if they are the truth, then it makes a difference. Um, just look at Tim Tebow. I mean, they hated the guy because he was open about 
believing in Jesus. They even made a website in order to find people who would claim that they had premarital uh, affairs with him in order to trap him and say, oh, he's not good enough. See, he says he believes in Jesus, but he really doesn't. And they couldn't find anybody. But that's the lengths that our society went to to try to trap this guy because he said he believed in Jesus because he made them uncomfortable. And so here are some other stats I have for you guys. If all of this doesn't make sense, statistics make sense. All right, here we go. First stat, 53% of American adults believe that if a person is generally good, they will go to heaven. 43% of born-again Christians, I never really understood what that meant. Like, aren't all Christians born again? Like, isn't that kind of like the thing that happens to you when you get saved? I don't know. Uh, I think they a better word would be just evangelical Christians, but that's what the stat said, so I'm just reading, I'm reading off facts here, guys. Uh, 43% of born-again Christians agree that it doesn't matter what religious faith you follow because all faiths teach basically the same things about life. And finally, 52% of evangelical churchgoers said that they believe that many religions can lead to eternal life. And so let's examine that. Let's examine that claim. Aren't all religions basically saying the same thing? Well, in short, no. They're not all saying the same thing. Uh, and they're just not. You know, there's some truth in them. There's some wisdom there in, in all, of, all of these faiths. There's some beauty in all of these faiths. Um, and there's, there's some goodness in all of these faiths. But as we're about to find out, Christianity alone holds the key to truth, beauty, and goodness. And so let's examine them one by one. Here we go. Buddhism is atheistic in nature. There's no final existence, and it's just an endless cycle of rebirth. So, you know, if you're just, you know, removing every material thing out of your life, you're going to reach nirvana, and I don't really know what happens after that. It's like, what, what do we do? We don't live forever in Buddhism. There's no heaven. Hinduism is an impersonal god uh, approached with millions. I think there's something like 600 million deities in the Hindu pantheon. So try to keep that one straight. Uh, and so they believe that God can be reached by basically anything. Uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, they don't offer forgiveness of sins or supernatural help. It's simply a bootstrapping uh, faith and striving to maintain good karma. Islam, they worship Allah. He's a personal God, much like ours. Uh, but there's no other gods but Allah, much like, you know, we don't believe any other gods outside of Yahweh. Uh, there's a permanent ban on idols and requires strict religious adherence through devotion and works in order to even get close to some form of salvation. In Islam, whenever you die, even if you've been the best Muslim around, maybe Allah had a bad day, going to hell. Doesn't matter. It's just purely on his whim, whatever his fleeting fancy is of the time, can land you in heaven, can land you in hell. Really doesn't matter what you do. Uh, New Age religions, there's no personal God. Uh, we're just striving for a higher consciousness, just trying to be one with the universe. I'm going to you know, go get my chakras aligned, then I'm going to go get my palm read, then I'm going to go do some tarot cards, and then I'm going to do all these little things, dabble, 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 and maybe one of them will get me there. It's one of those is going to get me right where I need to be. And Christianity stands in stark contrast to that. You know, all religions and belief systems are not the same. There's some truth, like I said, there's some beauty, there's some goodness, but they're not the same. Uh, whenever I did missions work out of high school in Africa, uh, there was this pastor there who, the closest pastor in America I can compare him to would be like, kind of, he was on the level of like Joel Osteen. He had a huge church, and he had churches all over Kenya, and, and um, we went in, to his house, which was an insane house. I would say that. It was insane, but he... Um, he was different than most kind of mega church pastors that, that I'd ever met because we get to his house and we're having this nice dinner and he's not eating anything. He's just like drinking hot tea because he, had, he was fasting. 
and he undergoes a ton of scrutiny in his country. That's beside the point. Anyways, he, um, he was telling us the story about whenever he was growing up, the particular tribe that he belonged to believed in one God, unlike all of the other tribes. Um, they did not practice witchcraft. They, in fact, uh, killed witches uh, in his particular tribe, and, and they believed that God lived up on top of this mountain, uh, the, this high mountain. If you got on top of it, you, you could see God, and there's uh, honestly a lot of similarities between what he believed and Judaism. Um, but Pastor Alan, you know, he, he was talking, and he said, even though we, we held these beliefs, and even though they seemed to be very close to Judaism, the one thing that they lack is Jesus. And that is where the difference comes in between what everyone else believes and what we believe is Jesus. Because Jesus did things, Jesus said things, he, he performed things, and he made claims that if they are true, then nothing else matters but him. Nothing else matters than what he said. And so let's examine Jesus. Let's consider Jesus for for a few moments, you know, we can we can think all these things. We can we can we can think that it doesn't matter what we believe, but but Jesus is standing in stark contrast to the modern uh, age. So we're going to examine what he did, uh, what he said. Right now, let's see. So no one has qualms with Jesus' existence anymore. Pretty much, no one that you can find. You may find some rando who's like, "Oh, Jesus wasn't real." Almost everyone agrees that Jesus existed. I mean, even Deepak Chopra believes that Jesus was a real person, okay? All serious scholars pretty much do not debate whether or not Jesus Christ walked on the earth. As a matter of fact, there is more evidence written down to attest to the existence of Jesus than there are to the existence of Plato and Aristotle. And no one debates whether Plato and Aristotle existed. People love Jesus' teachings, they love that he helped the poor. They love that he loved the meek. Uh, they love that he was generous. And they love that he was forgiving. People love that, right? You hear it all the time. Oh, Jesus was just love. Jesus was just so great and sweet to everybody. But he was also the truth. And so let's look first at the ministry of Jesus. Mark 2, 16 through 17. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus, at this time, he did exactly the opposite of what was expected of him. This is what got him in hot water. He did not come looking like the things that people expected him to look like. And honestly, my, my, my frustrations whenever I'm reading scripture is like, whenever Jesus says a hard thing, I'm like, oh, Jesus, that's not what I wanted you to say about that. Like, I, I would love to be a millionaire in one day, but you're saying if I start chasing after that, it could be hard for me to get into heaven. I don't like that. I don't like to hear that, Jesus. I, I, want, I want to have it all. You know, those who despise Jesus Whoa, hang on. Sorry, my notes are all jacked up today. (laughs) Those who were despised, Jesus loved and accepted. Uh, I think about uh, the the story of of the woman who was caught in adultery. Um, For those of you who don't know, Jesus is this lady, comes to Jesus because the Pharisees are about to stone her, and uh, they're getting ready to throw rocks at her. And Jesus said, those of you who are without sin, cast the first stone. See, Jesus called everybody out. He didn't, he could have let this woman get stoned to death. For one, she was a woman in the Middle East uh, in ancient times, so she didn't have a lot of value comparatively back then to them. Uh, she broke the law, right? She, they were kind of justified in doing it, but Jesus is looking at a higher level than they were. They were looking kind of baseline, and Jesus is calling people to higher things. Uh, Jesus performed miracles. He opened blind eyes. Jesus healed deaf ears. Jesus gave the mute a voice. Jesus cleansed lepers. 
He turned water into wine. And my AG friends, they still can't really wrap their mind around that one. Uh, he multiplied loaves and fishes, and he resurrected the dead. You see, Jesus' critics, they never questioned his miracles. But they really wanted him to stop because if he was the truth, if he was what he claimed to be, then things had to change. Their, that meant that their worldview that they had created was wrong. And we hate being wrong. I hate being wrong. Maybe you don't hate being wrong, but I like to be right all of the time. And even if I am wrong, I'll just keep on acting as if I am right, and we'll see what shakes out later. Like, we hate being wrong. And that's one of the main ways that Jesus is calling us to pay attention to him. We've got to pay attention to Jesus because when relativism creeps in, when we start this belief that it doesn't matter, it doesn't really matter, that's not the way Jesus lived his life. That's not the way that Jesus went about doing things. Next thing we can consider is the resurrection of Jesus. God loved us so much, and he hated sin so much, he was born and died and rose again on our behalf. It's why he was born of a virgin without sin, and he became sin on the cross. The cross is where creation mocked the creator. The cross was a place where the, the Hebrew people and the Romans were like, we're going to put this guy down. We're going to stop what he was trying to do because if he's saying the truth, it's going to be bad for us, which it kind of was. Um, it kind of was bad for him after, after everything shook out. Rome fell, um, and the Jews continued to be scattered across the earth because Jesus is the truth, and, and, and we don't like to hear the truth, so we're going to kill the truth. And so after they had done all their worst, Jesus looks up to heaven and he says two things. And this is another instance where we see that Jesus is the truth. He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And then he said, it is finished. Into your hands I commit my spirit. And so when he died on the cross, the earth shook and the sky turned black. And the centurion said, surely this man is the son of God. See, in that moment, he realized finally, after, after Jesus had died, he realized, oh, he, he was the truth. This, this, this was real. This was, he, he was who he said he was. And, and three days later, there was no Jesus. The tomb was empty. And, and, and so we believe that he was raised from the dead. And Paul puts it like this. He says, And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And so there was eyewitnesses to Jesus rising from the dead. So even when he died, people began to realize he was the truth. And then in his resurrection, it hammered it home. And that's why Paul used that in Acts. That's why Paul preached the resurrection of Jesus so much. Because if he really raised from the dead then that means something. If he really raised from the dead, if he came back to life, then you have to accept that he is the truth. And, and some people love to debate this. Some people say, oh, well, the Roman soldiers, you know, uh, they probably just were pulling a prank on those, those crazy disciples and just stole the body and, and hid it away somewhere. Um, but I think that Jesus' enemies would have loved to put on display his dead body laying there for everyone to see. Wouldn't that be your plan if, if, if you were one of these people? I mean, I, I, I just think that King Herod would have loved for Jesus' body to just be displayed, for all to see he was no more than a mere man. But they couldn't do it. Or people say the disciples, the disciples must have stolen the body away. If you think a ragtag group... <laughs> of average Joes, no offense, Joe, of average Joes, <laughs> uneducated people, were able to overpower and outsmart the greatest military force that the world has ever known, then I, I think the disciple stealing the body is more unbelievable than him raising for the dead because uh, I don't think that these guys are going to be able to do it. Maybe Peter, because he was a zealot, maybe Maybe, and a zealot was like a, he was basically, think of like a terrorist, like he was a trained assassin. Um, maybe he could have pulled something like that off, 
but I don't know if he could have taken on all of them or else his, his mission would have worked out in the first place. Um, some people think it was a sham. And again, I, 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 I don't see how 11 uneducated guys um, could, could have devised this elaborate plan and then continued to deceive people to this day. Not only did they deceive people then, They've continued to deceive people for 2,000 years. I, I don't see these guys being able to pull that off. And then the fact that no one would have talked about it, like no one would have been like, oh, guys, we really got a joke. We got these guys. We tricked them. Uh, I, I don't see that. I mean, what, to what end would they have done these things? To, to cheat the world into being a better place? Like, oh, man, these guys are going to be real good now. We tricked them. I mean, what motive? what they have had. They were going to be killed anyways by the Romans. Like, oh, that's what wakes me up in the morning. There's nothing like the fear of death. You know, it's like, no. Uh, I mean, the only one who doubted Jesus' resurrection out of the 12 was Thomas. And he said, until I see him with my own eyes and I put my hands in his wounds, I will not believe. And then what happened to Thomas? Thomas went on to be the evangelist to India. And uh, he said on his deathbed when he, he was killed, he said, I will never renounce my Savior. See, Thomas doubted. He experienced the truth, and he was willing to die for it. People aren't, I'm sorry, I'm not going to die for a prank. That's just me. I'm not, I mean, maybe Winston Bishop would do that on New Girl. But I am not about to put my head on the chopping block for a joke. That's just something that's not going to happen. If, if, if I'm not utterly convinced of the truth, I'm not going to die for it. And, and just look at, look at us now. Here we are, 2,000 years later, after extensive persecution. And there are more than 2 billion Christ followers in the world today. And so when we're considering the truth of Christ, we can't consider other Christians. We can't consider our pastors. You can't consider me. Don't consider uh, Pastor Bill, Pastor Hannah, uh, because secret, we're people too. Um, <laughs> Jesus was more than that. He was the truth. Um, and so the next thing, and the final thing, well, not the final thing, the next thing I want you to consider about Jesus is his eternal message, uh, which Paul summarizes in Romans 3, 22. And the NLT puts it, probably in my favorite way, it says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. See, the message of Jesus is that you put your faith in him, you pick up your cross and follow him. He will guide you. He will change you. He will mold you into something better than you could ever be on your own. He could, walking in his shadow, can get you into the Holy of Holies where you couldn't get before. It can get you into the presence of God. It can get you into heaven. Following Jesus can get you into heaven, and struggling on your own can't get you there. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. He's the truth. He is the one who gets us there. And finally, the last thing, and these are Jesus' words. We're going to consider what Jesus taught. Jesus taught something that goes contrary to this idea that it doesn't matter what I believe, you know, I'm just a sincere, I'm just a good person, you know, I help old ladies cross the street, I, I give homeless people dollar bills and quarters whenever they come up to my car, I say yes ma'am and no sir and thank you and hold open the door for people carrying babies and, you know, I do all these good things. And then Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. No other progenitor of a world religion ever made this claim. And so when we consider what Jesus taught, when we consider what he said, when we consider what he did, when we consider even how the disciples were changed based on what he did, there's only three conclusions that we can draw about Jesus. Either he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. And if he's a liar, then everyone who goes around saying, oh, well, I believe Jesus was a good moral teacher. No, he wasn't. He was lying to everyone. 
A good person doesn't dupe the whole world into believing something. Are you kidding me? That's a psychopath. <laughs> if he was a crazy person, if he was certifiably insane, if he's a lunatic, I don't think people were going to follow him. I don't think thousands of people are going to gather around and then experience these miracles and then something that he does is going to echo through all of eternity for 2,000 years afterwards. If he was a crazy person, surely the majority of the human race would have figured out by now that this guy was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, like, there's a reason that cults constantly come and go, come and go, and all these personalities pop up and are flashes in the pan and, and no one remembers them the next day because they were crazy. Clearly, Jesus wasn't crazy. Or we can say that he's Lord. And if he's Lord, then it means what he said was true. And if he's Lord, he's neither liar nor lunatic. You see, Jesus leaves no room for gray. When he says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me, there's no gray. And as bad as it stinks, as much as I wish that my friends who say, oh, I'm a good person, as bad as I wish and as much as it breaks my heart that they, they believe that, um, it's not the truth. And uh, it hurts. It hurts me because I love these people and I, I want them to see God. And that's why I tell them when they say they're a good person, according to who? I challenge them on it because I don't want them to to not be in the truth. I want them to stand in the truth. There's no room for gray. And one of my favorite authors, uh, G.K. Chesterton, he wrote a book called The Everlasting Man. And in the, at the time when he wrote this, um, he was wrestling with, with this relativism was really creeping onto the scene in a big way in the early 1900s. I mean, you had all of these crazy weird cults popping up in Europe, um, this is when you had the communist revolution going on. This is when things were getting really kind of weird in Europe. And, and Chesterton decides he's going to write a book um, because he's like, hang on a second. Um, there is the truth out there, guys, and I think you're missing it. Um, and, and in the beginning of his book, he's really calling out people who uh, teach uh, comparative religions. And he he's like, what are we trying to compare? Um, and for him which I kind of agree with, we, we use the term religion nowadays as if, it's, as if it's a bad thing, as if like, oh, well, well I've, I'm in a relationship. I'm not in a religion. But, but for Chesterton, religion means something more than just superstition, right? Today we kind of treat religion as superstition, but for Chesterton, relig religion was Christ, right? And so this is what he says in his book, and it's kind of long, so bear with me. He says, if anybody says that philosophic maxims preserved through many ages or mythological temples frequented by many people are things of the same class and category as the church, it is enough to answer quite simply that they are not. Nobody thinks they are the same when he sees them in the old civilizations of Greece and Rome. Nobody would think they were the same if that civilization had lasted 2,000 years longer and existed to the present day. Nobody can in reason think they are the same in the parallel civilization in the East as it is at the present day. None of these philosophies or mythologies are anything like a church, and certainly not a church militant. And basically, this just means a church with the mission of evangelism. The rule is that pre-Christian or pagan history does not produce a church on a mission. And the exception, or what some would call the exception, is that Islam is at least militant if it is not a church. The church is thus unique because it is an army marching to effect a universal deliverance. We say not lightly, but very literally, that the truth has made us free. And they say that it makes us so free that it cannot be the truth. To them, it is like believing in fairyland to believe in such freedom as we enjoy. It is like believing in men with wings to entertain the fancy of men with wills. It is like accepting a fable about a squirrel in conversation with a mountain to believe in a man who is free to ask or a God who is free to answer. We believe in something totally different than what the world is selling, than what other religions 
are selling because our faith is in Christ who made claims to be divine. Our faith is in Christ who actually rose from the dead. Confucius is still buried in the ground. Buddha is still buried in the ground. The Dalai Lama is still buried in the ground. Jesus rose from the dead. And if he didn't, then we're super wrong. But I think the evidence uh, suggests contrary that he really did. 2,000 years, the church is still growing. 2,000 years, we're the largest religion on the face of the planet Earth, and we don't have to kill, steal, or hurt anybody to make that so. The only answer is that it is the truth, and there's no room for gray. And so really the answer is, what do we do with that truth? What do we do? Do we let the world continue to go about thinking that as long as they're sincere, they, they can get to heaven. So oh, you're just a good person. We can't be concerned with people's emotions. We should be more concerned with people's eternity. So let's pray. Lord, we just ask that you help us, Father. Help us to love people in truth the way that you did. Help us to show people the way, God. Help us to be a church on a mission. Help us so that we can see this city, this neighborhood, Lord, come to you. We want your name to be on everyone's tongue when they begin to think about the truth. We want your name, Jesus, to be the epitome of truth, the epitome of goodness, the epitome of beauty. It's found in you. I just pray, Father, that you Help us to continue the work that we've already been doing this morning when we we examine the six years of of Village Heights, God. We want to do more. We want you to continue to use us to see this world change. I pray that you give us the grace. I pray that you give us the wisdom. I pray that you give us the love to show people and to not be afraid of the truth because you are the truth, Jesus, and, and you love us more than we could ever love ourselves. And we just ask that you help us today. In your holy name we pray, amen.